Welcome to Team Super Dad. In this episode, I speak to John Campbell, football director, captain of merchant ships, sex coach, and simply an awesome guy with an amazing life story. I know you're going to love it. Enjoy. Roll theme. Welcome to Team Super Dad. Real dads creating their best lives ever. More time, more money, more fun. You are not alone. You're on Team Super Dad. Hello, welcome to the Team Super Dad podcast. My name is Johnny Jensen. I'm the founder and creator of the Team Super Dad community. We are a community of dads kickstarting our lives, and that's especially dads after divorce, separation, or loss. But everyone's welcome. And this is the podcast. So each week we speak to uh, coaches, entrepreneurs, sports people, famous, and also everyday dads with a story to tell. There really is nothing that we can't achieve in life. And so often we lose track of where we wanted to get to, the things that we wanted, the amount of fun we need, money, as we like to say, be more, earn more, play more. And so welcome if you're here for the first time. If you're a regular listener, then it's great to have you back. Of course, if you love this show, then uh, give me some feedback because that helps me improve it. If you don't like it, well, feedback as well helps. But more important than anything, I would love you to give us a review on iTunes. Uh, iTunes, more than any other platform, is important. Uh, the the reviews, the positive reviews, help get your podcast featured. If you don't listen on podcast, if you don't listen on iTunes then by all means, leave us a review wherever you're listening. Uh, my favorite app on the iPhone is Breaker. It's a really socially engaged uh, podcasting uh, app. But wherever you listen, Spotify, we're on Spotify, YouTube, uh, App- Apple uh, Music, so iTunes and Google Play. <laughs> Where else? Basically, we're everywhere. So thanks wherever you are listening in. Like I said, today's camp uh, interview is with John Campbell, awesome guy. Um, he's he's in his seventies, uh, but he speaks with all the um, energy of of a young guy. Uh, but he has such wisdom and so many awesome stories to tell, um, both from his family, his parents growing up in Africa and India, um, stories of alcoholism, um, stories of of. of his new wife and being a sex coach and also working with football stars and athletes and so just a really amazing guy I wish I don't that's not fat I don't mean I wish like I couldn't have it but when you speak to people like John you realize how important it is to have people like him in your life just to give you a fresh perspective to give you encouragement to really help you see um the opportunities that lie out there and how we can and how we can actually make them happen. So enjoy the episode. Enjoy the podcast. If you're a dad, if you are a famous uh, or someone who you think would be a great uh, guest on the show, maybe that's you or maybe you know someone, then put them in touch with me. You can also go and uh, see the briefing um, notes on bit.ly. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash T-S-D briefing as in Team Super Dad briefing. So T-S-D briefing. And yeah, and it's not only men that we want to talk to there's loads of mums out there loads of women i'm interviewing a a woman on sunday we're going to be doing uh, affirmations talking about the power of affirmations and and speaking good words in into your life and so yeah this really is about uh, empowering dads empowering people like yourself and i to kickstart their life in the area of money and fun relationships um work of course um, and, and, and most important than anything, having a great time with our kids. So without further ado, uh, let's get on with the episode. I know you're going to enjoy it and I'll see you on the other side. Hello, uh, welcome to the Team Super Dad podcast. It's me, Johnny Jensen here, uh, founder uh, of Team Super Dad and coach of Super Dads Everywhere. As always, we have great guests on this podcast. Um, <laughs> I rue the day when we have a rubbish one, <laughs> but today, uh, today is, is no exception. And I'm really delighted to introduce John Campbell to you all. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Johnny. Great to be with you and all your oh, guests. I've lost, I've lost sound on you, John. Hold tight. I've lost sound on John. Hang on. It's probably me. Hang on. It is me. <laughs> <laughs> hadn't hadn't lost sound at all. You're actually in my ears. 
Come on. You can hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, it wasn't you. It was me. And I can play games by going. I know you can now pretend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there we go. That's, that just shows we're live. That's, that's always good. People, people love to know that you are actually live. So, John, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? I mean, there's, there's, there's so many cool things about you. I just put in the sort of in the, in the little bio. We've got a, um, a former uh, Brighton director. We've got a, a, a dad, a grandfather, uh, a, a coach to, to, to footballers and, and athletes around the world. There's, I, I wasn't quite sure from our previous conversation, but there's some kind of like sex coach thing somewhere in there as well. What is, what's the, yeah, yeah. there we go. We'll get onto that as well. <laughs> um, we might, we might leave that to last since that's the last thing I learned to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That's what you were telling me. Yeah. yeah. So John, why don't you do, do your intro uh, uh, proud and tell, tell us about yourself. Yeah. Well, where have I? I've been on a journey, Johnny, uh, Johnny has been magnificent. You know, I call it awakening journey because I think every one of us, is asleep when we first come in and you know we all have different paths different journeys no one is wrong no one is right but when when it's your time to wake up i think it's your time to wake up uh, i was born in india uh, i feel very blessed and appreciative now because i was born into a culture that was very free i was raised in africa um, my mum was alcoholic, which was a wonderful gift to me because it meant she didn't worry about me. She was, <laughs> she was, off, she was off, off her head most of the time. So I was free bird, you see. So in those early years, I was totally free. I did, never went to school, didn't have any schooling. So my days were playing, playing with my, you know, playing with the natives, really, the locals and the animals and what have you. And were you there for your dad's work or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad uh, had worked overseas for many, many, many years. You know, they, he met my mother um, <clears throat> in Malaya. Oh, no, in London. Took her to Malaya, married her during the, and then the Japanese invaded and they escaped. He, How she old escaped. are you, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people, I'm, 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 I'm 73, I feel like 33, <laughs> and some people say I'm 2003. So, there you go. Good. Yeah, so, you, uh, I'm, oh. I mean, my dad's 76. I got a neighbor next to me who's 83. And, and, uh, so it's, it's, uh, I think a, we are old people are getting younger, I think, um, which is, yeah. which, which can only be good for me as I start. to yeah. get The more people are, are waking up and there's a lot of people realizing now that, you know, we are what we think about. You know? So I like to think young thoughts and be, you know, thinking good things. Yeah. So that, that was my life early on. And, um, then we came to England when I was nine for the first time. Was it seven, eight, eight, I suppose I was, yeah. And it was a terrible shock to me. First of all, the cold. Never been used to the cold. I've been born in India, raised in Africa, two different countries in Africa and Australia. And so that was a shock. And going to school was a shock. You know, my mother's, you know, I went home, went home the first day out of the cell. Well, that was interesting, but what do I do yeah. tomorrow? And she said, you go there every day. And I nearly went into, <laughs> you know, I thought, well, I can't, I can't go there every day, you know. So I just, you know, went through primary school and um, lots of things happened. And went there from there on to, I got the 11 plus, went to grammar school. And uh, Whereabouts in the UK were you living? Uh, in Sussex. When we first came to England, we lived for a year in, in a little place called Cooden Beach near Bex Hill. And then my mum did what alcoholics will recognise as a geographical. She managed to convince my dad that the reason she drank was because of the place we were <laughs> it's a classic by the way it's a classic so he bought that one yeah, okay well we'll move you know so we all moved uh, further along in sussex to burgess hill and that's where i went for my last couple of years in primary school and uh then went to grammar school in brighton um so i went on the train every day you know down to brighton from burgess hill and back again it was an all boys school. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I didn't take it seriously. I didn't. I didn't think that's what school was for. I always thought it was to have fun. So, and I was lucky. I was in the C stream, and one C's <laughs> fellow school. If there are any of them watching, remember one C were put into a classroom called the shack, and the shack was fantastic because it was an old wooden army Nissan shack, you know, and it was across the other side of the playground. So we had the advantage that when the master was coming to deliver the next lesson, 
we'd see he had to come out of the main building and he had to walk right across the parade ground, which was our playground as well. Yeah. So we had all this time to get ourselves back in order because we used to have mayhem in between lessons. So Good basically fun. they put all the troublemakers in the same class. And yeah, put them, I think that was the idea. Really, on the other side of the playground. Yeah, in place. case anyone's like wondering, bit of a bit of a uh, context there, Brighton is – is pretty much uh, a party town. It is also historical. Uh, comes up in uh, regularly. Comes up in the top ten places to live. Um, I did used to live there actually. Uh, and curiously, my ex-wife didn't really like it there, and she promised me things would be better when we moved. <laughs> I, she wasn't a boozer, but uh, I certainly got a geographical done on me there. Uh, so yeah, so Brighton's Brighton. I mean, Brighton was a lot of fun. It's always been a lot of fun, really, as far as I understand, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing was, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but I always, I had a lot of wisdom as a young boy. You know, I knew, I used to question things, you see. I used to say, well, why? Well, they weren't used to that, you see. They weren't used to a 12-year-old questioning the teacher. Well, why? I want to know why. You no, basically that, came from a different culture, basically. Yeah, absolutely, you know. And I, I kind of, I, cu I couldn't understand why they wasted time trying to force information into our young minds about subjects we haven't got the slightest interest in. That, to me, was already dawning on me at 11, 12 years of age. Yeah. So I'd just have fun. You know, if I wasn't interested in the subject, I'd just wouldn't have any notice, play around. And, you know, they used to say things to me like, in my school reports, every school report said, John is a daydreamer. <laughs> John is hampered by a poor memory. None of which, well, I was a daydreamer because I realised the power of visualisation, even at that age, because that's what I was doing. Again, I was visual what? Is that a cult culturally as well? That that's kind of something you were you were encouraged to do in India, as opposed to what is this? No, I don't know what it was, Johnny. I just I just thought, well, if I'm not interested in this subject, what am I interested in? So I'd start focusing on what I want to do. So I focused on traveling the world because I was already a born traveller, you know, a world traveller at the age of twelve. So I found, I, I wanted to get away from home. That was number one. So I would visualise going to all these countries and travelling the world. And, and of course, it all happened. Yeah, yeah. And the memory thing, when they say he's hampered by a poor memory, I wasn't. I've got. I've got. And my wife would tell me, she says, "I can't believe your memory." And what they didn't realise, the teachers, bless their souls, they didn't realise I wasn't interested in remembering what they wanted me to remember. Yeah, that's all yeah. it was. But give me something I, I'm interested in. Cool, I can pluck it out like that. You know? Yeah, yeah, awesome. And listen, John, just for context, let's just explain to everybody what you do now kind of thing and then and then we'll come back to come yeah, yeah, sure. where, where we're at yeah. it'll just you'll just give some context to all this yeah, sure, story sure. that you're telling and then different questions yeah, yeah. we're going to ask about as well yeah yeah well, what i what i what i i don't even like the word teaching what i introduce people to who who are ready annie and i use a term we we only work with people leaning forward and Annie's your current wife and business yes. partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's amazing, yeah. So we work with people who are leaning forward because it's too much hard work for those who are leaning backwards. We give them yeah. that up. We tried that. It didn't work. So the ones who are leaning forward, we actually teach them that if they get, if they understand how their mind works, they can change their whole life. And you see, most people, I would say everybody, does what they do in life for one reason, really. We're all wired to what the world would be called selfishness, which is not really a negative thing. We do what we do because we think by doing it, we're going to feel good. And that includes everything. Like Mother Teresa did wonderful work in the world, but really underneath it was because what she did made her feel good. She felt good. Yeah. By all that help she gave. So that's the same with everybody. So what we introduce people to is a concept instead of looking for something outside of yourself thinking that's going to make you feel good every single person has the power to feel good first and then just watch how what they enjoy and what they like will come come through them you know it's we all say johnny it's it's simple so simple and not easy because of the way we're hardwired if you go around, if anybody goes around and just spend a day, so I'm just going to go and I'm going to listen to conversations, okay, amongst the public, you know, whatever, whether it's on the radio, whether it's in a cafe, whether it's on the beat, whatever, I guarantee you 90% of the conversations, people will be talking about what they don't like. Yeah. They'll be having a moan about something. Even when I do it, when I coach people, I say, first thing I want you to do, I want you to go around 
And every time you go in a shop or a store or whatever, always say, how are you today? And oh, I guarantee you, ninety-nine percent will say not bad. Yeah, John, I was about to say that, and I was about to say, <laughs> I, I what I hate the most is when people say that because genuinely, when I say to someone, "How are you?" I'm actually interested in how they are. And they don't even hear the question; they just give their automatic answer of That's not it. not too bad, thanks. And I'm like, that doesn't even mean anything. And, and if it, even if it did. It's actually quite negative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because so I always, I have a stock thing, and I love it because I feel good when I do it. I say to them, how do they? And they go, not bad. And I go, oh, that means pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what it's I say, I'm way. doing pretty good, yeah. Yeah. So that's, so, so the teaching is as simple as that. We have, a, we have a little game we play. We say we have to eliminate the four Cs. And the four Cs are complaining, criticizing, comparing, and controlling. Yeah. Now that's a task. That is a tough order. It is a However, task. And that's, a what, that's, what, that's why I was so keen and interested to to do this today. You know, when I when I came across, uh, you know, I came across you via Gary Stevens, the former Tottenham and England uh, player. So it was great to get connected that way. But then when I saw your videos and heard you speaking about these things and the different way you were talking about how this impacts footballers and athletes, and and, and you know, to me, I just thought, wow, this is a whole paradigm that many dads won't be aware of and when they're looking at their relationship with their kids and their relationship with their ex, the success they're having in their career and life and everything. This, this is a, this is like a hidden wall for many people. Um, and they don't even know it's there and they're, they're butting up against it, wondering why things aren't quite going so well. So, you know, having, having you on today and hearing, yeah, about, about your story and about how you came to this, but also some insights that people can get access to, you know, breaking through that those four C's that you just, that you just spoke about is, yeah. is, is brilliant. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you, Johnny. And it is true. I mean, I can honestly say that I, my life today is constantly joyous, happy, and free. Who would have thought that? Yeah. yeah I, and you see, the thing is, I think that's the desire of every human being is freedom, really freedom, freedom to be themselves, you know? Yeah. And, and I haven't always been like that. That's the thing I want people to know. Perfect. Well, let's I get on to both those been. things. I want yeah. to get on to how people can access that, but I'm also wanted yeah. to sort of, to sort of dig through some of, some of how that, how it didn't always be that way. So you were talking about school earlier. How much of an influence on your, on your childhood was your dad? Well, I don't know where to start here. Well, I'll come straight in with this one. I think I mentioned offline, you know, when we were phoning, I found out only two years ago that the man who I, thought was my dad for 71 years you know yeah i'm 73 now was not my dad wow it was not my biological father and that was something that came to me as a feeling for the last 10 years and it took me 10 years before uncovering and going going and doing a test with my with my uh, young nephew to confirm that there is no way his grandfather could have been my uh, his great-grandfather could have no sorry his grandfather could have been my father yeah so but the man who raised me, as often is the case, he was my model. He was my male model. You know, he was a very kind, very gentle. He was a disabled man, born disabled, with a, def a deformity of his left leg, so he couldn't fight in the military. He had a lot of shame around that, which I then picked up on. And uh, and he was a doormat, basically. You know, my, he absolutely adored my mother. Absolutely adored her. She was a very beautiful, elegant, you know, came from quite a wealthy background. And I think he, what he told me once when he, when he was on his, you know, towards the end, and he said, I said, why did you stay? Because she was pretty, pretty hardcore. Yeah. And he said, your mother was such a beautiful woman and I'm a cripple. And that really brought me to tears, you know, to think he, he thought he was his disability, but he right, was a yeah, yeah. good guy. So he had a, a big influence. It, 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 uh, I became very similar in that respect. I attracted not the most uh, gentle of, of people in my life, you know, uh, but also gave me tremendous positive, you know, he was a very, yeah, very kind. Um, yeah, and he loved, loved, loved his kids. And I mean, he knew that I was not his child. He didn't know. He didn't tell me, but yeah, he yeah. knew, and he treated me, if anything, and I used to find it was uncomfortable. So, I mean, he probably treated me better than he did uh, his own son, who I thought was my full brother, but was my wow. half-brother. See, I was the youngest. So, yeah, he was, um, 
yeah, had a big influence on me with my football, my love of football. He was, he loved his football, loved his sport. Where was he from? Who did he support? Fulham. Fulham. He was born in. He was so born he's in London. Actual London. Yeah, London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, he tells me. I've got to share this story just for people who are football lovers to see how the game has changed. He took me to Fulham, Craven Cottage, when a guy called Toss Chamberlain. Some of your older viewers might have heard of him. He was a winger, played for for Fulham, uh, and Johnny Haynes, who was captain of England at the time, and a imperious football. I mean, wonderful pass of the ball. You know, he was captain of Fulham, and he was the first person to break the wage thing when they when they were used to be on twenty pound a week, and he was the first hundred pound a week player. Okay, and Johnny Haynes used to ping these forty yard balls out to Tosh on the right wing, and you know, Tosh would pick his foot up, his right foot up, to trap the ball, and it would go under his foot out for a throw into the other side. And Johnny Haynes was a little bit, people would say he was arrogant. You know, he was so good. And he was standing with his hands on his hips, shaking his head, you see. Well, he did this one too many times in this match. So Tosh walks across to the dugout, where they just used to throw their tracksuits in the dugout in those days. You know, no subs, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And he went to the dugout, pulled his tracksuit, pull it, pulled out his wood bones and sat and lit up a wood bone in the middle of, the, <laughs> of what, what is equivalent of a Premier League game. <laughs> and that's, I think that's a great story to tell you. Though, no, it really. Well, apparently at Tottenham, um, they used to, literally, um, not all players, I think, I think apparently George Best was known to do this as well, run out at half time and have a, have a swift half at the, oh, yeah. at the, at the pub oh, yeah. on the corner. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, in those days, it was a regular thing. They'd have a bottle of brandy in a dressing room. Yeah. And every, everybody would have a nip of brandy. Yeah. Now, I understand that, especially having gone the, down the drinking road myself. I don't drink now, as you know, for 20 years I'm drunk. But I understand that because that's what it does. Yeah. It takes, it takes away any fear. Oh, my God, you can take on the world when you've had that little nip. Yeah, true, true. But so that was football. So, um, so made me fall in love with football. Yeah, fall in love with football. And so you're living in Brighton and – what happened, what happened after school? What, how did you get on at school? What, what happened afterwards? Well, I, uh, I, I messed around for five years, so I failed all my GCs. And uh, Dad called me in and said, you've got to get your backside into gear. You got to, So I just decided, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go. And I decided I wanted to go to sea because it was my fastest route out of, <laughs> to get away from, from home, right? Yeah. So I just got my head down and I got, I got five O-levels. Uh, I got an A-level in art. I was very gifted in art. I had my first drawings published in a, in a little book when I was doing my studies at grammar school. And, um, yeah, I sailed through, got five O levels and then took off for the merchant Navy, uh, and started my own journey. And, uh, I mean, I was so terrified. I was so anxious in those days. I can remember I joined my first ship and obviously I was a cadet. I was an officer cadet and all the other officers wearing, you know, gold band, you know, one ring, two rings, three rings, captain, four rings and all that. And going into the, I was terrified sitting at the offices in the officers' wardroom dining room for dinner or lunch, whatever, and all this gold brass all around me. You know, I was terrified. I was just mortified, terrified. And I wasn't old enough to drink. I was only 17. And the captain called me when I signed on and he said, listen, young man, you know, you're under, I was indentured apprentice and that makes the captain responsible for you. Right. He said, you're not allowed to drink alcohol. All right, you understand that? You know, I said, okay, no problem. And I can remember going into the officer's bar, which was very grand, you know, Crystal Row, uh, the steward all done his white jacket, and I mean, all the big time, and all these officers with gold bands around you. And I'm sneaking up to the bar for the first time, and the steward says to me, what would you like to drink? And I said, an orange juice, please. And just then, this group of officers to one side happened to burst out laughing. I was so self set so self I thought they were laughing at me, and I flaked out. I flaked out through anxiety, thinking they were... I fainted? Yeah, I fainted. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, so from then on, so then on, that's when I discovered alcohol was a great help to me. So from then on, this is typical, I used to go into the engineer's mess because the engineers in their boiler suits couldn't come into the luncheon room. You know, they, had to, they had a special mess room. So they had their own fridge in there with beers in there. And I used to go in there sink a couple of beers to give me the courage to go in our bar and ask for an orange juice. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so before yeah. I forget, right, what, so what would you, what would you, what would you say to a dad who's trying to encourage their teenager 
who's a bit of a tear away at school and he's got to get knuckled down and just get some kind of a quality. What would, what would you be saying to, to, to your to your 15, 16 year old self at that time in school as a dad? What I would be saying to him is there's something which you love and you enjoy. What, whatever it is, find out what it is. And if they say, oh, I don't know what it is, I said, all right, close your eyes and imagine you've got a million quid in the bank and you've got no family. What would oh, what make your heart sing to do as a like you know as a job? Whatever that is, that's what you could be doing. Yeah, because like the majority of people tap into your intuition. Yeah, exactly. Tap yeah. into what the majority of people get influenced by A, oh, oh, is it gonna bring enough money? Or B, or B, what the family gonna say. Yeah. If it doesn't fit the family <laughs> It's all unconscious, this, you know. You know, a lot of Asian families struggle with that. Um, the Jewish families, yes. um, their sort of predefined route is if it's not what you want to do, then what the hell do you do? That's right. That's right. So so that to answer your question, I'd be saying to him, find out what you love doing. There's got to be something you love doing and do it. Uh, don't don't um, be respectful in the classes you're in with subjects that you're not the slightest bit interested in. So in other words, you know, make sure you honor other people who are wanting to learn that subject. But if you're not, just take it in. Don't, don't be worried about it. And certainly take no notice of exams. I say to, I said to my kids, my own kids, I said, exams, just think of exams as a way the authorities need to check and see how good their teachers are. True. Don't take it to mean anything about you. It's just a number. Yeah, yeah. And to focus on, you know, appreciating so and, and well, now, with the knowledge I have now, I'd be teaching them to get rid of the four Cs. Don't complain, don't criticize, don't compare, and don't control. Yeah. Well, let's get on to that as a, as a framework shortly. What, so how many kids have you got then? Six. Six? Six that I know about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm going to have to do a lot more shagging before I start having that, that uh, problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say. All the, I've been to 103 different countries the last time I checked. Wowzers. Oh, the because world. of the sailing stuff? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. and bus- business travel. Business, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, where, so when, how long did you stay in the Navy for? And, and, and you know, in, in amongst all that, I, where did uh, you meet your first wife? Well, I, I, uh, I went in at 17. Uh, I became a captain at 26. I was the youngest guy on the first ship I was captain of, which was, oh, did they take the piss out of me? I tell you, a full, wow. a full crew from the Humber side, Hull. They were piss takers. And um, I left when I was... That's pretty impressive, by the way. I, I don't think we can just skirt past that. I mean, I, don't, well, I, don't, I, can't, I can't contextually <laughs> yeah. get it other than... We just went from talking about the officer's mess and, and the grandeur of it to yeah. 11 years later, you're, you're, you're captain. the captain of your own shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it was amazing, really. I mean, I, I got married quite young to my first wife, to my, my eldest daughter's mum, and uh, um, the marriage broke up uh, after a couple of years, really two or three years, um, and I, I left. I was in shell tankers which I found complete boring. I've never been one good for bullshit, Johnny. And there was more bullshit in Shell than there ever was in the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, which I started with, you know. So the, in other words, we'd be in the Persian Gulf, two o'clock in the morning, 110 degrees, and the captain would shout at me to put my shirt on. And I'm thinking, who am I putting my shirt on for? You know, in the middle of the Persian Gulf, and any all that shit. Yeah. So my desire was, I kept thinking, one day when I'm going to be captain, I'm going to be so good. I'm going to be good to the guys. I'm going to make sure the ship is well fed because when you're at sea, that's all you look forward to is your food and your mail. So that was a big driving force for me to be the one to make the decisions to make people's lives better. Already, I had that kind of feeling. So when I eventually got into the supply boat game, um, and I was captain. I had a ball and we had a ball and we, I would divert the ship, divert course to go and visit these unvisited islands and we'd be, <laughs> put the, put the lifeboat over with a, you know, two cases of beer and a few roast chickens and go off and mix with the local ladies. We had a ball. <laughs> Brilliant. The world's changed. Maybe the world hasn't changed for people in those kind of jobs, but I think, you know, my dad used to, he was into motor racing and, 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 he was a um, works Ford and Toyota rally driver, low, um, uh, Lancia Stratos. And, you know, they used to do crazy stuff. They'd have rallies in the middle of the night 
just you know wherever they wanted to start one they would they you know the the the, the parties and the the women and the you know and, and literally then go get up the next morning and be like right they're on the start of the of an international rally and they're off you know kind of obviously sport is, is far more professional and stuff now but you do wonder if people are having as much fun my dad says to me problem is son you're not having enough enough fun yeah and yeah, look, i'm totally with you I'm totally with you. And a classic example is, I mean, I, I literally did that. I was on a journey from, um, where did I, I signed up? I signed on the vessel in uh, Djibouti in what was then the French territory, the FRs and ESRs. And I was going down to Mauritius. And I thought, oh, my, I looked at the chart. I saw there was a virtually uninhabited island. There was just a few, you know, I thought, oh, let's go and have a look at that. So I diverted off and we had we put the boat down, we had the back, they call them banyans. You put the boat down, get some beer, have some chickens, have some fun, come back to the boat, and we went going again. No questions asked, you know. Now, from from some time, officers on the watch of vessels have their own colour. So the chief officer has a maybe a red pen. I don't know what it's. Second officer will have a blue pen, pencil. Yeah. And the third officer will have a green pencil. And at the end of their watch, they have to mark where the ship's position is. And at the end of a voyage, all the charts go to head office to be calculated how much miles you any officer wasted on their watch. They could, you know, if they went three miles yeah. off course or two. I mean, let alone detour and go and have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. It's, it's you know, it's got so serious, and that's what I bring into everything now. It's got to have fun. I've got to have fun. Everything's got to be joy. Football's got to be joy. One of the biggest problems I see in the game is. Teams where they're managing there's lack of joy and fun. Well, Mourinho, blimey. Yeah. That man it, lacks it, joy. Yeah, but, but you see, there's a classic case of somebody that came in like a breath of fresh air, if you remember, when he came yeah. from Porto. But then that thing called EGO, the ego, starts and rises and raises its rotten head, you know. And I always say EGO, ego, the ego means easing God out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, when, you when start, I go, when I go, yeah, that's <laughs> like me that's having a moment. That's, yeah, yeah. I say this to, to, to various guests, yeah. I'm like, whoa, I just wonder well, it's, it's mind the, there. And, the, and the word, of course, I realize the word God can, can really trigger some people, but you see, I don't think God's got anything to do with religion, nothing <laughs> to me. God is just it's a, a word for love, unconditional love, you know. Oh, I, 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 I find I have, words very interesting. Yeah, I have similar views on. On faith is yeah. to think that one faith is wrong over another faith. I, I, yeah. I don't get. You know, if 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 we come from different parts of the world, you know, if ultimately if our faith is a pretty wholesome faith, which yeah. I think most most mainstream faiths are pretty wholesome, yeah. then who are we to each tell each other that our gods are first of all different, let alone better than each other's? The likelihood is that it's a god for all seasons kind of it's no, adapted it. to fit a culture that's, yeah. as i know it's not, perhaps not a truly biblical view but but certainly as i see god operate in the world today i think it's just you know there's generally a force for good and uh, and and if we could unite behind that as a faith it's then enough. then we do stand a chance of not yeah. blowing ourselves into smithereens yeah. yeah no and i think people are waking up to that and for me i i, I got a great i have a lot of fun with words you know i love words because they very, and I always look at the word God and the word love and the word now all have in the middle of them one big zero. One big zero. Love, God, now. They all have this big zero. And I, I think there's a message there that it's a circle and it's nothing. It's now. Love. That's what God is. It's love. You know? So what's the encouragement there for you, for people to be, to be present in the moment or what, what are you saying? Yeah. Well, to become aware, first of all, to come aware of all of their triggers in life, you know, well, what triggers you? Well, it, you know, that's always a healing. It's just a, a sign there's something to be healed. And for me, I, I happen to use the tool of forgiveness, but it's a different type of forgiveness. And, and because you see peace and love and joy are our natural states. That's our natural state. So I will say to people, what went wrong? And what went wrong is, in my belief now, 
is that we forgot who we are. We forgot that that's who we are. And we got further and further and further and further away until the pain of staying the same gets bigger than the fear of making a change. And that's where we come on our journey. And and I believe everybody will be led to a point in their lives where this is not working, whether it's in a work, work situation, relationship or whatever. And that creates a, and you know, even, even in football, you know, you talk about Mourinho. Mourinho is a man, in my opinion, he's in so much pain. So we talk about up, like upset upon upset upon upset, yeah. Yeah. guilt, resignation, fear, yes. this kind of baggage that we end up carrying around with ourselves. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the sign, the red flag, is when we start blaming everybody else. And if you think of Mourinho's, especially, it got worse and worse and worse, in my opinion, but everything was everybody else. It was the media, it was this, it was that, it was this, and nobody loves me, and blah, 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 blah. There's the sign. The minute we start pointing the finger, and I say to my coaching clients, we'll always look and see. When you're pointing the finger of blame at somebody else, it's very symbolic. We've got one finger pointing at them, but we've got three fingers pointing back at us. That's as a little reminder to take our focus off them and bring the focus onto us. Yeah. Well, I know my own marriage and everything, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously a lot of upset, the breakdown, the blame, but somewhere has to come on the journey, a, a, a look in the mirror to see, well, what, what could I be responsible for? And when you start asking yourself that question, suddenly so much appears. They're like, you're looking, you're now looking again at what went wrong, but from a, what was my role in that? How could I be more responsible if, and then, and then something I found very positive is keep going back. Well, well what caused that? Well, what caused that? Well, what caused that? And what caused that? Oh my gosh, I caused that, <laughs> you know, yes. not, not wrong or blame, no, no. but, but when, when anybody can start to take a look at the situation and realize that they have some function in it, they had some responsibility, then freedom comes from that because, and, and quite often, you know, in, um, even communicating that to the person, the ex or whatever, or the person you're upset with, you can create a, some freedom in that relationship. And, and, and that's really important for me, looking at, at dads and people rebuilding their lives and having strong and positive relationships in their life. Somewhere or another, that relationship with our, with our ex and their family, their friends, when it's left as a big stink, it's quite a massive shadow on, on, on one's life, really. Um, so I think, so, you know, in what, in what you're sharing there, and I see that I heard in that, in that big zero, in that, in those important words, that really being present to where am I at? What's going on? What can, where, where, how can I enjoy today more? What can a baby be responsible for? That's, that's exactly yeah. what I heard. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting. You bring up the words responsible, you see, again, I, I love words. You see, if you say to someone, how do you spell responsible? They'll tell you, you know, are you? responsible and i always write it response a b l e instead of i b l e and i say because really the word means able to respond and when people look at responsibility as ability to respond rather than responsibility you know something on my shoulders it changes and my life changed when i was able and honest enough to acknowledge i was a hundred percent responsible for everything in my life everything now, that is a big ask of people. It took me a long time before I truly acknowledged that. And then I used a little analogy with people. I say, well, hang on, tell me about all the terrible things that have happened in your life. So they'd, they'd you know, go on this great thing and explain all these terrible things. And I said, okay, they all seem different, different places, different people, different things, all the rest of it. What's the one common denominator in all of it? It's you <laughs> or it's me, you know, it's yeah. me. Oh, okay, never thought about that. So I'm the one that can change everything. And I truly believe, Johnny, I truly believe that you don't have to worry about the ex or the ex-employer or whatever. If you do the work on yourself and your relationship with them, in your head, in your head and your heart, you don't have to run around and start giving them hugs and tell them more. So, you know, if you do that work, it has to change. It's almost like, uh, our life and our relationship is like a mobile that you hang over a kiddie's cot, you know. If you move one part of that mobile, all the rest of the mobile starts to shift. So that's the beauty of this work. I don't have to worry. See, when I broke up from my last wife, it was, I just want to be friends. You know, I just said, look, I know it's over. It's time to move on. No, nobody else involved. I just said it's time to be on. Yeah, and just the context, when, when that was, that's, you had four kids with the second wife? 
five. Five, five kids with second wife. Yeah. And you, you were together how long? 27 years. 27, 27 years. years, yeah. And I knew, I knew in my deepest soul, I knew that the work was done. I had to move on. And I was just like, oh, I'll just get a house down the road, you know, and every, everything will be fine. But of course, that's not where she was. She was upset. She was upset. Yeah, 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 she's angry. She's angry, you know. Yeah. So she rebelled against me, you know, in a really tough way, especially around the kids and all, you know. Eventually, when I got into this work, which I tell, talk about later, maybe, the A Course in Miracles, I started to do the work. So I would do visualizations and picture her in, in a golden circle. I'd bring into some into my consciousness somebody who I really was at peace with in my life, who I loved, and they loved me, and, was, and I'd get a picture of them, then I'd get a picture of my ex-wife, and then I'd merge the two in, an art, in a circle of golden light into one picture in my mind. And, you know, this is leading-edge stuff. A lot of people turn and say, what a load of old cods, what That's okay. It's not my work. What other people think of me is none of my business. I know it works. And when people experience it, that's when, they're, that's when they change. They say, my God, this works. And the great thing is about this type of work, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to believe it even. If you do it, it works. And that's the great thing because so much of our programming is we have to understand everything. We have to understand. No, no, we don't have to understand. We have to experience. Truly, truly, yes. And and um, I was listening to some Wayne Dyer the other day, and and someone else put the, uh, the day before that. I can't remember. But but you know, he was saying we you know we talk about oh, well, I'm, I'm listening to Stefan uh, um, Stefan Arnio's book, um, Hard Times Create Strong Men. Great book. I listen to a lot of books rather than rather than read them. Yeah. And um, you know, he was talking about faith and saying, you know, well, whether you believe in God or not, there's too much weird stuff goes on in this world to say that we just got out the sea one day and evolved into 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 who we are. There's too many coincidences. There's too many. Like, how did all the other Neand- Neanderthal races whatever not make it and and we did how how come so much of our fruit and veggies shaped like parts of our body and that and they actually help us treat those parts of it there's too many coincidences in the world and then if you're going to say oh i don't believe in a higher spirit or god or whatever because i can't see it well we 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 believe that our mobile phones work. <laughs> yeah, that's we right. Yeah, that yeah. We, idea. We, we don't we don't question what electricity is done when exactly. we put the light switch on we just put it on and it's there yeah. So I, I think so for, for me, when people can tap into that and realize, yeah. you know, you don't have to believe in God to actually realize, okay, so having a faith, having, having an awareness that we are spirit bodies, not just physical bodies mm. is an access to, to a whole world of possibilities and connections and healing. Mm. And, and, um, I got, uh, uh, you know, talking to some guy the other day who was, who was, who was pretty depressed and, and, and really doubting every single thing that was going on in the world. But he was so shut off to everything that he, he all, it, was, it was all about what he could see and touch. And, and that looked right. pretty bad at that moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I mean, I love, I love, uh, I did a lot of reading when I started to wake up because I didn't read anything until I was in my 50s till I started to wake up. Um, and I, I read a lot of uh, Sufi books from the Sufi master, like Hafiz was a Sufi poet. And he had a lovely phrase. He said, in the end, all human beings only have two choices. They either come to God dressed for dancing or they get wheeled into God's ward on a stretcher. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful. And it's, it's people, you know, they, God, the word God gets a bad rap because of certain religious programmings, you know. But I understand what he's talking about. And, and I see it happening. I see it happening in my family, in my friends, in the greater world. Whenever it looks as though, oh, something terrible is happening in their life, I always know, no, 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 no. This is just a little, that's, they're in the wheelchair getting into God's water. <laughs> they're not necessarily going in on a stretcher. They might be going on walking sticks even, you know. I went in on walking sticks in my book. You know, I was lucky I didn't get to the, the stretcher. But everything that seems to be going wrong in our life, is truly a gift. And my wife, Annie, you know, I mean, she was a total non-believer. She was a scientist. She's a neuroscientist, PhD from Oxford, real bub, bub, bub in the head, you know. Didn't believe in anything that you couldn't t- touch, feel, smell, taste, whatever. And then when her husband of 27 years passed away, uh, she was with him. 
she, you know, they knew it was going to happen, you know. She'd been with him sort of at the end there for the last week. And, and then when he took his last breath, it was a summer's day, and she saw, she actually saw a ball of golden light leave his body and go out through the window. And it scared the shit out of her. You know, she was a scientist. She didn't believe in anything like that. But what it did, that was her wake-up call. Wow. And when she started to Google it, she found it was a very common, common, common occurrence. Yeah. And that led her to reading a book by um, Eckhart Tolle, which you've probably heard of, called The Power of Now. And in The Power of Now, she came across A Course in Miracles, which is how we met eventually many years later. So if you, anyway, by the way, if you, if you send me these uh, books in an email afterwards, I'll put them in the, in the notes of the show. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, what, what's fascinating, Johnny, and we're writing about it now together, um, is when I look back, when she looks back on her life, we can see all the dots. You can see how, oh, that led me to this and that. Yeah. Oh, 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 there. And, you know, it's like, it's just, it's uncanny the different things that wake us up. It's like I didn't have any belief in the afterlife or anything else. And I had a captain working for me. This is when I started my own business, I owned ships. And his wife was Norwegian, and I thought she was cuckoo. The same as a lot of people thought I was cuckoo when I got into all this stuff. It's the same thing. And she was always going on about this stuff, and she told me about a book called You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay, which I'm sure you've heard of. And she gave me the book, and I read a couple of what, nonsense. It became my Bible, eventually, I can tell you. But what happened with this woman, I realize now she was a, a an angel sent to me, if you like, to wake me up, because I was back in England, and um, her husband was captain on one of our ships, and she used to phone me from Norway. And every time she phoned, I used to say to myself, oh, tell her I'm not very that She's crazy. She phoned me up one day, and she said, John, could you please contact my husband and tell him to be very, very careful, you know, Norwegian accent I'm trying to do, on the starboard side of his vessel, be very careful. And I'm going, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Two weeks later, telephone rings, and it's her husband from the ship. And he says, Captain John, I'm sorry I have to report there's been an accident. One of our sailors has fall, fallen over the side of the ship and is churned up in the propeller. Dead as a dawning. And I went, oh, my God. I said, Captain Finn, what side of the vessel? And he said, starboard side. And I thought, wow, that's exactly yeah. what she told me. So what's all that about? Anyway, so I realized she was a, what I like to call now cooperative components that come into her life to help shake us a bit, you know. So from that moment, I started to read that book, You Can Eat Your Life, and then I started to read lots of books. And then it was just... It was just an accumulation of learning, really. Yeah, and I think that's – so you called it an awakening. You know, for, for me, it was really about starting to discover personal development. And um, I was – what did I read? Um, Susan Jeffers. Um, yeah. uh, what's it? Um, ah, I can't remember the name of the book. <laughs> Anyways, like, entry, feel, the, feel the fear and do it anyway. Feel yeah, the fear, feel the fear anyway. and do it anyway. You know, so it's kind of entry-level personal development, but, but – yeah. I think everybody, if anyone's listening to this and they're kind of, they're just not even thought about any of that stuff. You know, if there's any books that we've talked about here, the power of now, feel the fear and do it anyway. I ended up doing the landmark forum. You know, people, um, people, I think people with a strong faith actually can quite often have a, a greater degree of personal awareness. And I think discovering that for yourself, you called it an awakening. I think it's so important for the people to, to go on that journey. And, 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 and there's a degree of, 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 of what we'll teach and, and, and encourage people in team super dad is, is to be aware um, and is to believe that there's, there's the, the, the universe is out there for us, that there is more good in mm -hmm. the process of life than bad. That if the more that we think about and focus on our goals, the more likely they are to come to us. Yeah. The more we subconsciously think on bad things, the more likely the bad <laughs> things going to happen. I always <laughs> help people, people that worry about getting sick. Yeah, yeah. Well, well absolutely. absolutely. It's a fear. It's to become aware there's nothing to fear. And the other thing I've learned on the journey is everybody's journey is personal to them. So I do my best. Sometimes I mistake. Sometimes I fall off and forget. I forgive myself for it. But to avoid trying to criticize other people's journeys, just that's not my work. 
I focus on what I do. Law of attraction will bring people into my energy field who are open to hearing what I do. Those who aren't, those who I have, you know, some people, they, they're not interested. That's fine. It doesn't mean I can't get along with them. What they follow is up to them. And that's where I think religion is changing, so-called traditional religion. Many of them are becoming more open to that concept of let everybody believe whatever works for them. Yeah. So, you know, it's very, but it is about encouraging people to connect with their inner self, that part of themselves, which knows everything. You see, it's like, and not to deny it, just to be aware of it, where your feelings, your feelings are giving you that, that intuition. If that's your inner guide, intuition, if you break the word down, means inner teacher. So that's what to listen to. But most of us were too busy up here. You know. and, and if someone's never really, if someone's unsure if they've ever felt that, mm. where, where could they look to, to, to do an audit? How could they check well, themselves? Well, I think something early days, look for a mindfulness group, teaches mindfulness. And I mean, this comes into our sexual practices. So it's unbelievable yeah. how this will change. And even, but some, yeah. I just put like real bait. Someone who's never yeah. really, yeah, just someone sitting there thinking, mindful. I've never heard my intuition speak. What yeah, could they, yeah. what could they yeah. do at home this afternoon or this evening to, to sort of see if they could first tap into that? Get quiet. Switch off everything. Switch off everything. Sit down. Close their eyes. Focus on their breathing. Just bring their attention to their breathing and see what comes up. And then maybe ask a question. Say, what is the best thing for blah, 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 for me to do about blah, blah, blah. And then just get quiet and see what comes in, what comes in, what comes in. Because whenever we ask, we'll always get the answer. And it may not come in that moment. It may come, something may suddenly pop up on the TV and you think, oh, my God, that's the answer. Yeah. That's what I was asking. A it can come in all different forms. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, 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 absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, internet or whatever, I, yeah. I, 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 I could not get on a dance floor, Johnny. When I got sober, I realized I'd never been on, I was 51 when I got sober and I stopped drinking alcohol. Sorry, wait, sorry just, we, we kind of missed, was, oh, yeah, we could talk for hours, John. This is crazy. Yeah, 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 no. Were you an alcoholic or? Well, I don't use that term now. I don't use. No, that sorry, okay, talk. but I mean, for, no, no, for no, other no, people, they te technically yeah, they would. But you were. Right. What, yeah, what, what do they call I, it? Like I, a like a like a functioning one, or yeah, oh, very. I was very functioning. I was running a fantastic business, a family, and everything. All the all the things that you know, big house, the big cars, the big holiday, all the rest of it. So I was very. Functioning. Are we talking here? It's like absolutely mullered, or or just a, a bottle of wine a day, or you know? No, a, it would be, it would be a, a daily intake. A daily intake. So within a French, the, a French person, I would say, of course I have three glasses of wine a day. Yeah, I, but you see, um, problems with alcohol got nothing to do with how much you drink. It's about what happens when you drink. Right, okay. So there was a change in mood in me. All right, sometimes a positive change. So as I said, I developed this confidence, which I didn't have. You know, People would say things to me. They'd say, oh, my God, I wish I had your confidence, John. This is while I was drinking during my drinking time. And inside... This voice is like, oh, my God, I wish they knew. I wish they only knew. Oh, if only they knew, they wouldn't like, you know, because so it's not they how I of, if they, they think they're giving you a compliment and actually you're just loading up more guilt. Yeah, yeah, because that's not how I felt. Yeah. It was all the, the alcohol. I still say, you know, that was a positive thing for me. I would, I, I'd never have got my master's at such a young age, being captain of a ship, because I was terrified. I was riddled with fear. Dutch courage type. Dutch courage, that's yeah. exactly it. So anyway, coming back now, I had never been on the dance floor. And I got sober and I was at a convention and I and one of the women said, Do you want to come and have a dance? And I absolutely in, in just distinct in, in the moment said, No, 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 sorry, I don't feel well. So I used a woman's excuse. So you, you use woman's was excuse. it a nice lady? Yes, very she was very nice. And yeah. I would have to do, I, I would have loved to have a dance. It was like knee jerk action. I was so ashamed and felt so guilty. I went to my bed and I lay there and I looked up on the ceiling. I still tell you it was at the um, Clacton. It was in Clacton. And I asked the question, why can't I get on a dance floor without drinking me? So I asked. And I'm a firm believer today that whenever we ask, we always receive. On the next, didn't take me long. The next day, I'm at college. By this time, I'd given up my business and I was studying to 
be an addiction counsellor. I was at college and one of my friends came up and said, oh, you want to read this book? It's called Healing the Child Within by Charles Whitfield. Little thin book. As soon as I started to read it, I said, that's the answer to my question. I can't get on that dance floor because I've got this little boy in me that's riddled with shame and guilt about his body and what he looks like and all the rest of it. And I said, right, why, how can I get this healed? How can I get it healed? And again, a week later, I saw an advert on the right-hand side of this magazine saying, the Hoffman process, the best inner child healing ever in the world, a quote by John Bradshaw, who was a great author in the field of, you know, addiction and codependency. And then I looked, and the head office was in Arundel. Now, Arundel is the town where I used to run away from home and sit in the grounds of Arundel Castle when I was 11, 12 years of age because I was so, I wanted my own space to get away from my mother who was drunk most yeah. of the time. So that was the first thing. And the next thing was I phoned up and, uh, oh, no, the other thing was this John Bradshaw, who had made this quote on the advert, I was in the middle of reading his book at the time called Healing the Shame That Binds You. So I saw that. I said, that's it. And I just phoned up. I didn't know anything about the course. I had never known anybody that had taken it. I didn't read anything about it. And I just picked the phone up. I said, there's my credit card. Put me on the next one. And I came off that course. It's seven days. Very, very intensive. One of the most amazing pieces of work I've ever done. And you can't get me off a dance floor. The minute music's on, I'm up there. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> John Travolta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. John. I, I went up on the Monday after. I was going up to London, and I was on East Croydon Station platform, and the Italian guy that has the cappuccino thing there, he's got a, a ghetto blaster, and he had it on full blast. And I'm standing there dancing. There's all these guys in these bowler hats going to, to going to the city. Thought I was off the wall. I didn't yeah. care anymore. <laughs> and, what, and, and when did you meet your... Current wife Annie, how did you meet her? Did, um, did you loved, did you I, think I, you were going to meet in someone, or, or was it written well, that off? Yeah, I, I had. Um, I never gave up on love. I've always loved women. I think they're one of the biggest gifts we have in mankind, in for many different reasons. I've, I've never been a woman hater or anything like that, you know, misogynist or anything like that. So I knew that I wanted to meet somebody, and I'd also got to the point of acknowledging that I'd done all this healing, and I've done an immense amount of you know physical, mental, emotional healing yet I hadn't yet looked at my sexual healing because I had sexual wounding. And I said, right, I want to I wanna heal my sexual self. You know, I was now 63 years of age. And I'd come out of a, a quite a long-term uh, dysfunctional relationship. I say dysfunctional, lovely person, but 5,000 miles away. There was another pattern, you know. What am I doing in a relationship? It's only 5,000 miles. I hardly ever see it. It's only on the telephone. Wow. It's a pattern. It's a pattern. Anyway, so I made that decision. I ended the relationship in a very beautiful, loving way with her. And then two weeks later, bang, ask and you'll be good. And I was introduced to a woman who was a, uh, an Osho. She had been an Osho follower of Osho, you know. And she taught me a different way of having sex. And it blew me away. All these anxieties I'd had for all these years, boom, gone. And we knew that we weren't going to be a long-term thing because, yeah, we, we just accepted it wasn't it, that wasn't what the relationship was for. She again lived a long way away in the, the north of north of England, and um, and then I met Annie because I was on a spiritualsingles.com website, dating website called spiritualsingles.com, where you meet people who are awakened to a spiritual journey. Yeah. And you can then look for people, you know, because it, it makes a big difference if you've got somebody that's at least on a similar part. That of course. The same part. So anyway, Annie saw my profile and saw that I was Course in Miracles. And she had been brought to the Course in Miracles through the death of her first husband. And then, by the way, I didn't tell you that her fiancé, who she was about to marry 10 years after the death of her first husband, she came home one day and he was dead on the kitchen floor. So she had that to contend with. So she had two big wake up calls. But anyway, wow. she saw my my course of miracles thing, and we met. And it turned out that we would have met anyway because we were both signed in to a course of miracles speaker who was coming to London, and we both knew this speaker, and we both had signed up to go to that talk. So we would have met anyway. But here we are meeting as a result of meeting each other on this website. Oops, I've lost you there. Hang no, on. I think you just turned the video off. That's all. Uh, uh, Hang on, hang on. Hang no, you're, on, back, hang you're on. back, you're back, you're back, you're back. Second, you're back. Oh, you're back. Good. Yeah, so we met up in London um, 
for a coffee and uh, that was it. We knew instantly. We had electricity. We held hands. We just touched hands and there was electricity running through us. And, and uh, yeah, we've been together ever since. We've been together virtually 24-7. We pra- See, the lovely thing is when, when you're in relationship with somebody that understands 100% responsibility, you don't get any blame. So in other words, you'll never hear me say to Annie, you make me feel this and when you do that, no, 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 no. And she will never say the same to me. Yeah. It'll always and, be. And tell us what, that's so powerful in a, in a parent relationship as well, talking to your kids. Absolutely. Um, if, you know, yeah. I don't want anyone to skirt past that, like taking lessons out of these, these fabulous conversations that we have, um, both in talking to people in work, in a relationship, and especially talking to your child. Yeah. Can you just explain what you're saying there? You never, yeah, yeah. You never, you never blame the child for your emotions. No child ever makes you so angry. You're making me angry. You're pissing me off. You're, yeah. you're, you, you, you've upset me. That, yeah. yeah. What is that doing? That deepens the child's sense of unworthiness, just like the parents already got that unworthiness. Otherwise, they wouldn't be speaking that way. Yeah. And what it's doing, it's saying that. You're giving your power away. So it's, and it's not about, a lot of people make the mistake of believing that this means I can't feel angry or I can't feel sad or I can't feel pissed off. No, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. Otherwise, that becomes a spiritual bypass, I call it, where you go, oh, oh, oh I, I feel good. It's all pushy. <laughs> no, this is about feeling the feeling, saying, oh, and knowing that the feeling has got nothing to do with what that person, that child or that institution or what that government or what that prime minister or what that president of the United States of America is saying. It's only to do with my perception and my judgments about what's happening. That's what causes my disturbance. And that's where I take ownership in the moment and say, I have a choice. I have a choice. I can see this differently. Because when you make peace, your 100% first goal. And peace is, believe me, not a small gift. It's a mighty gift. So when you become unaffected, for example, people will often say to Annie, what what do you think about Brexit? What do you think about Okay. No problem. What will be? be. No problem. It's not going to affect my life. And that's not arrogance, meaning what about the other people? No. I can be more help to anybody in the world when I am peaceful, loving, and joyful. That's when I can be a help to my kids. Yeah. Because the greatest gift you can give your children is your own happiness. Yeah, and in very similar to what you're saying, I spoke to Tolly Bacan uh, once. I was, he, he did like a group Q&A session, and he, he said, um, he said, you know, quite, quite flippantly, he said, oh, no, I, I haven't been angry since 1982 or something. It's like he, he had a very specific date, and, and he said, he gave up being angry. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's not a thing in his, there's no anger, angry state of angriness, Mm -hmm. you know, in his world and the freedom, you know, he went on to explain kind of, but the freedom that gave him over his relationships, his, his own upset, his, his ability to love others, his ability to manage situations, um, seems kind of woo woo, but also actually when you just break it down and go, wow, what if I was never angry with my kid? Like, like you say, not, not being upset, not, not making sure they're tired of their bedroom, but where can I, where can I be in control of my feelings and, and own, own my words? Yeah. And that's why Johnny, it's essential to be a good parent. You have to look at your own childhood. Some people say, Oh, I don't need to go back there. I don't Okay, fine. Just see how your life goes until people look back and see, you see, you either pass it on, you work it out or you'll pass it on. Yeah. It's always one or the other. And that's exactly what it's about. So it's not my kid suddenly starts painting, puts paint all over the, you know, bedspread and whatever, whatever it is, you know, of course, not acceptable, right? Has to be changed, but that does not equal me having to disturb my peace of mind by getting angry. And if people say, but that's, everyone gets that. No, 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 no. That's the first thing you do with people. Start owning your statements. I get angry. I get angry. You don't have to. That's why you could line up five different parents and put the same scenario to them. And maybe three of them will get angry, but two of them will say no. So you could still, it's not about you don't correct the child. It's about the energy in which you correct them. You can just as easily say, you know, Johnny, 
And always, I always say to parents, always tell your children and everybody what you want, not what you don't want. There's a line in The Course of Miracles that says, never make another wrong. Now, some people say, well, what is that? How, how can you not make something wrong? It's not saying that there won't be things that are unacceptable, but you don't talk about what's unacceptable. You talk about what you want. So in other words, a situation like that, you say, Johnny, I really would love it if you uh, took great care with that paint, make sure it stays in the pot, and da 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 and when, when you start to just use these little tools, and that's why I took it into football and had stupendous success working with Africans in the township in South Africa, just by talking about what you want, not what you don't want. You hear many coaches in football say, don't do this, don't do that. You know, don't dive in in the penalty area. Straight away they dive in because the subconscious mind cannot process negatives. Subconscious mind works on words and pictures. So if you somebody say to somebody, don't dive in, all they see, they hear the words dive in, and they see dive in. And you can test this yourself with children. If you've got young children, give them something to carry and say, don't spill that, don't spill it, don't spill it, they'll spill it. Yeah. Because if I say to you right now, okay, Johnny, close your eyes and picture a pink elephant. What, what comes into your mind? You see a pink elephant, right? Totally, yeah. Yeah. Now, if I say to you, right, close your eyes and picture don't, what's the picture that comes in? No, you say don't picture a pink elephant. You, you, still, th you yeah. still think of a pink elephant. Yeah, 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 exactly. Don't picture a pink elephant. You still see a pink elephant. Yeah. Because if you try and picture don't, don't doesn't bring up a picture. Yeah, don't spill it. They're yeah. so like, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, of, instead of saying hold tight hold tight hold tight yeah and, I, so, and I've learned that I, I try that so hard with my kids as well is to is to speak in that way and some of the compliments I've had about my children recently and bearing in mind they've been through the divorce and that's been tricky mm -hmm. for them but I've had people compliment my children on how um, gracious they are how confident they are how how open they are and, and willing to speak to people adults young people stand up because, i witnessed it didn't i with your little, oh yeah you totally yeah, did yeah with, yeah thank you for, for that, that being was, was it josh jago 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 i knew it was a j yeah yeah they're a beautiful angel see they're angels they sometimes parents need to remember they've come to teach us and what have they come to teach us they've come to teach us how we used to be and how we can get back to being that way. Yeah. Because we're, life is about having fun and joy. Not about struggle. It's programs. It's programs. I always say to people, imagine you're like a computer and you've had all these programs put in. But the great thing is, you know, just like with your computer, you can erase them and put new programs in. And it's got nothing to do with age. I'm living proof. Yeah, totally. I'm having the most joyous life. Wow, John, there's so much we could talk about. I mean, we, we, we're, um, we're going we're gonna to have people listening for hours here. I think, uh, you know, there's, when, when, I, when I meet certain people and we, and we really click, there's such a connection around the goals and intentions of Team Superdad and to, um, to put together perhaps a worksheet or a, or a, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a webinar together for some, for some team super dad members. And, you know, we can maybe work out mm. a way where you can really do some coaching with people for an hour. So that actually some of these awesome things that we've spoken about today, we can put in place some practical ways that they can access these things, talking about intuition, talking about getting over grief, talking about, being present in the moment, forgiveness, responsibility. I think there's a, a, a really great opportunity here to, to, to put something together for the, for the team super dad community. So my little question for, for, for the end of these things, I, I feel, I feel awful that we're going to have to have to come to a close, but clearly there's definitely a, a great opportunity to get together again. But my final question is what have you learned about yourself that you wish you knew when you were younger? What have I learned about myself? that I wish I'd known is that I am beautiful, innocent, holy, which means whole, whole, perfect gift to life, and that I'm here to join with others and enjoy life to the full. That's my purpose. My purpose in life is to have fun and joy and then to extend that to others. 
And I wish I'd, I wish I'd known that, you know, and that what other people think of me is none of my business. True. That's, that's two very powerful things. What's more important is what I think about them. That yeah. will decide on how your relationship with them is going to be determined by how they feel, how they are towards you is going to be determined by how you, how you are towards them. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, and I, you know, I, for me, just to acknowledge you and your age, you know, and people, people talk about age, like it's this thing that we can't talk about anymore, but to have someone in their seventies, who's been to 104 countries, who's got five children, how many grandchildren? Six, six, six children. Six children. Six, how many grandchildren? Six, six grandchildren. Six yeah. grandchildren. You know, so when, when someone with that much wisdom says, I wish I'd realized this about myself when I was younger and, and, I, and I'm not, and I wish, you know, not going to pay, not going to be bothered by what other people think of me. I want people to really listen to that and think, okay, to what degree am I aware of that? To what degree am I incorporating that into my life? Because mm. if we don't listen to people who walk this path before us, then we don't really stand a chance. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm so grateful to have spent this time with you today. Learned so much about you, such wisdom to pass on uh, to others, but also to take on board myself. So, and I'll John, say one thing, Johnny, if I may. Do, yeah. Many people question Annie and I. They say, so they say, why well, you look so young? And we say, they, they say, can you tell us why? Well, I say, yes, we have sex every day. I'm a great believer in everyday sex. Keeps you young. And it's ageless when you're taught how to do it. Awesome. Well, we, de- I don't know what, we definitely will have an, an, a, 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 a longer talk on that. But well, John, you know, you. You, where can people, where can people connect with you and work with you and, and, and well, uh, find we have you two, online? two websites. We have one, which we, is we talk about sex.com. We talk about sex.com. So I'm John at we talk about sex.com or miraclesrock.com. And I'm on John at miraclesrock.com. So take a look, whichever one draws you, and and it's by, and I have to acknowledge you, Johnny, because I think it's always a I think it's an inborn thing that one always admires somebody who has abilities which is like con, you know complements what you do, but you don't have them. And what the way you put this together, sensation, I love it. I think you've done a wonderful job, and I appreciate it. I appreciate having this time with you because you're a uh, lovely guy. Thank you. Likewise, I know clearly. I can't wait to have um, more opportunities to involve you with Team Super Dad and, mm-hmm. and to share your wisdom further. Can I tell you who you remind me of? I always think we got doubles because everybody thinks I look like Michael Caine. You see, I've been stopped in the street. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm not sure. Hey, not really. You remind me of uh, a wonderful footballer we have at Brighton, or we had at Brighton. He's just come back again now to act as a coach you have a look at him so it's called steve sidwell steve sidwell i know steve sidwell yeah he used to be at chelsea reading you have a look at him put put a red wig on you yeah exactly i'd say got a lot of red hair (laughs) fantastic thank you johnny brilliant john and i will get off you you know there's different books we've mentioned and stuff or i'll listen back to it and we'll put those in the show notes um so yeah John, once again, thank you so much to everyone that's listened to the end of the show. Thank you so much. The magic is at the end of the show, as I always say. So um, for those of you who have stayed this long, you are, you know, you're of the, the 20% kind of thing, but, but the magic is here. So stay tuned for all of the podcasts right till the end. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you inside the Team Superdad community over on Facebook or on the website, teamsuperdad.com and in the Team Superdad uh, program. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you, Ollie. Take care. Bye now. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I love interviewing John. I, I mean, I love interviewing everybody, but particularly when you, you start talking to someone who's got such energy and so many stories to tell and how they weave into such a positive message. Team Super Dad is all about that, basically. It's a positive message for dads uh, and mums. I mean, blimey, I, I've been wrestling with this whole idea of, of, of is this only for dads? And increasingly I'm wondering if it's actually about mums and dads of the same mindset Uh, these we are people who want more from life people who feel empowered by their choices people who um, are fed up with being I don't know bored having things go wrong uh, and we really want to have more more out of our life and I think that the idea that that can't be for women or that there are you know imagine basically group of men and women in in that in that uh in that mindset i'm thinking about our 
upcoming firewalking events and looking at some events for next year where we're going to have a, a number of different speakers on the those six areas of, of life for the health, wealth, relationships, faith, fun and personal power. And and really having a great time there, doing some empowerment, arrow breaking and um, bar bending on your throw and, and ultimately ending the day with the firewalk. So stay tuned for that. Come on over to the Facebook community and let me know um, when you would like that event to be. We've got the Christmas um, I've called it the Christmas and New Year happiness course. It's basically a hangout, uh, a weekly video call and hangout for dads and getting through Christmas. And sometimes we don't have our kids all as much as we want. Uh, and other times we perhaps uh, would like a few more friends and a bit more fun over Christmas. So I'm here to help. Uh, I can't do that on my own. So we're here together as a community to help each other. As always, thanks so much for listening. If you're still tuned in, then you are the crew that matter the most. Send me your ideas, thoughts and suggestions. If you haven't left that review yet, please go and do it on iTunes or wherever you're listening into. This is Johnny Jensen, Team Superdad out. Take care. Bye. This has been Team Superdad. Find us at TeamSuperdad.com. Join the Rebuild program and create the best life ever for you and your children. You are not alone. You're on Team Super Dad.